All right, so welcome everyone back to 264A automated reasoning. Uh, today we will be transitioning into the applications part of the course. We will be talking about the subject of uh, learning from a combination of uh, data and knowledge. We will end up introducing new circuit types, uh, but they are based on sentential decision diagrams or SDDs that we studied um, last week. Uh, these new circuit types, which are uh, probabilistic SDDs or what's known as PSDDs and their conditional version, uh, end up being used to represent probability distributions. And uh, as you will see, the delta between SDDs and the probabilistic version is pretty small. And all of the nice and uh, sometimes refined and intricate properties of PSDDs are due to the underlying properties of uh, SDDs. And we will see um, uh, the application of that in the area of learning from a combination uh, of data and knowledge. And just for historical reasons, uh, SDDs were introduced in 2011, PSDDs in 2014, and conditional PSDDs uh, just a couple of years ago in 2018. So let's go ahead and start with our discussion by heading to the uh, whiteboard. All right, so um, let me start first by a high level motivation about what we mean uh, by learning from data and knowledge. Uh, this is something that is, in a sense, a holy grail in AI, and uh, there is a lot of interest in this, but it could mean different things, depending on what are you learning, and what do you mean by knowledge, and so on. So in, in this lecture, uh, we are learning probability distributions, and when you're learning a probability distribution, there is the, usually the notion of a probability space. That is, you have a set of variables uh, that represent your domain or the phenomena you're trying to reason about. And those variables define a set of possibilities, right? Variable instantiations. In this case, I have four variables and they're binary. So uh, there is basically 16 possible instantiations or uh, 16 possible states of the world. And knowledge here will mean um, domain constraints that are expressed in logic. And the effect of that is that your knowledge effectively is telling you that some of these states of the world are impossible because they conflict with your knowledge. So as we've seen when we looked at uh, logic, logic effectively eliminates possibilities, okay? So the idea is that we would like to learn a distribution uh, but over only the feasible states of the world as defined by your logical knowledge, something like this. And the main insight that we'll see here is that if your um, feasible states of the world, which we call the structured space as opposed to the probability space, if those are represented by a tractable Boolean circuit, in particular an SDD, then learning a distribution over the structured space become facilitated. Um, and in fact, we will see that the PSDD allows us to do that. And facilitated here has a number of meanings. One of them is that estimating parameters or learning becomes easy in some cases, uh, inference uh, becomes easy and so on. Now, the main reason why combining knowledge and data is useful is as you would expect that uh, you would then need less data um, to learn uh, because that data now is complemented by knowledge. You, you want to think of uh, the notion of information. What information are you using to learn? And you can view data and knowledge as two types of information that you can use uh, for that purpose. And again, uh, intuitively, you would expect that uh, the learned objects in that case will be more general, more robust. You'll hear a lot today in machine learning about dealing with the problem of uh, seeing out of distribution examples. That is, if you only use data to learn, then you have trouble when you start seeing things that were, are not well represented in the data. The machine learning systems do not do very well because they are basically just using data for that. If you complement that with knowledge, you can do a better job at that. And the techniques that I'm going to be mentioning today have been used in both supervised and unsupervised learning. We didn't talk about what these are, but let me just say that we'll be talking about today will be in the sphere of unsupervised learning. 
this is usually is viewed as somewhat uh, more resembling of what humans do. A lot of what happens today in AI is actually supervised. That's the use of neural networks. We may talk about this uh, later in future uh, lectures. All right. So what I'd like to do is first one slide on probability distributions um, as a reminder. Um, and then I would like also to review SDD circuits in a couple of slides, because as I said, even though we're going to be talking about probabilistic SDDs, they're main properties stem from the properties of SDDs. And then I want to talk about this notion of a structured space a little bit with examples uh, to show you how does this really come up uh, and what kind of knowledge you can use. And then we will introduce uh, PSDDs and we see how we can learn from data and knowledge. All right. So a word on probability distributions. Um, let's look at this example where I have three variables, earthquake, burglary, alarm. And let's notate these as follows. And as you know, you have three variables. They're binary in this case. That induces eight possible worlds. We've worked with this quite a bit in, in logic. And when I attach numbers to these worlds that are between 0 and 1 so that um, all of them actually end up adding up to 1, I will call this a probability distribution. And the main thing you want to do with something like this is compute what we call uh, marginal probabilities, all right? So the marginal probability, let's say for the event A, that is the alarm triggered, um, this could be any alpha, any propositional formula here. You simply look at the worlds that satisfy that formula and add up their probabilities. So in this case, it's a very simple event, A is true, then I, you know, that's in this world, this world, this world, and that world. So I just add up their probabilities and I get the marginal probability for A. Uh, if you want to compute the marginal probability for not A, you would sum the, in this case, the complement set of worlds, right? So it would be this guy, this guy, this guy, and that guy, and so on. And you can do, you know, more uh, complex events like this one, what is the probability that the alarm would trigger and there is earthquake. In this case, uh, there is two worlds that satisfy this, one and three. So you simply add up the corresponding probabilities and so on. And then of course you have uh, the notion of conditional probability. But before I do this, let me mention an issue of notation. So you see what we're doing here is having the comma. This is common, common in probabilistic reasoning and it basically means A and E. And uh, marginal probabilities are the basis of computing what we call conditional probabilities, like what is the probability that there is an earthquake given that the alarm triggered and the formula looks like this. So this is a marginal probability, a marginal probability, you divide them and this is the more general uh, base conditioning uh, as it's known. If this is an arbitrary event alpha, arbitrary event beta, then probability of alpha given beta is just uh, that. So I'm mentioning this because we will see that we will be learning distributions and except that the representation of this distribution is not going to be tabular like this because this is an exponential uh, representation. We will represent them using PSDDs. And then the question becomes, can you really compute marginal probabilities effectively or efficiently on these new uh, representations? Now, let me go and uh, do a quick review of sentential decision diagrams. and. Um, remind you of the main underlying properties behind these circuits because you're going to see it's going to be the secret behind a lot of the magic that you're going to see uh, later. So as we mentioned, uh, SDDs are based on this notion of an XY partition, which you can think of it as a way to decompose Boolean functions, right? So I have a Boolean function and which is the same as having a knowledge base, right? So whether you have a set of logical statements or you have a Boolean function, that's the same thing. And the idea is I'm gonna take and partition its variables into X and Y and rewrite it like this as a bunch of components, some components over the X variables and some components over the Y variables. And as we mentioned last time, uh, for this to be an XY partition, first of all, we call these guys primes and we call these guys subs. And the idea is I wanted the primes to form a partition. That means none of them is zero and the uh, conjunction of any pair of them is inconsistent and they all are mutually exclusive. So we're using here the engineering notation, viewing these as Boolean functions. Again, Boolean function or a Boolean formula the same. And when you have this, uh, that's what we call an XY partition of the function F. And remember that if it is compressed, then it's unique. So the idea was, here's how I build an SDD circuit. 
you give me the Boolean function and I'm gonna apply this decomposition and then I'm recursively gonna decompose each one of the G's and the H's and I keep doing this until I reach boundary condition. It's as simple as this. The one missing part of this is since this is unique, given that you choose X and Y, how do I choose X and Y? And this is where the notion of it, V3 came in, that I will give you a V3 which provides a recipe uh, or an instruction set of how do you choose X and Y at every step of the decomposition. So when you start at the beginning, you're gonna choose the root node and that defines your X and Y. Variables in the left, under the left child, variables under the right child, now there's only one way of doing this, right? If you're gonna get a compressed XY partition. So that gives you the first level of the decomposition. And then if you wanna decompose further, let's say, how do I decompose this guy? Then in this case, you go to this guy here and that tells you how to split the variables in this case. And in this case, it will be, this is your X and this is your Y. Again, left subtree, right subtree, and you just you keep doing this. So the fact that I'm giving you a V3, and the fact that the XY partition is compressed, then there is one unique outcome of this process. And here's an example of that, uh, an STD circuit that is uh, actually uh, was decomposed according to this V3. And here you can see the very first level XY decomposition. And you can see that it gets repeated. So in this case, you can see that all of these uh, conform to this uh, node. This is the primes. Um, <clears throat> look at this prime and this sub, you'll find the prime here is over the variables LK and the sub over the variables uh, PA and similarly for that. Okay, now I just want to make one more observation about SDDs. And this is something that will end up being uh, the secret behind a lot of the magic that you're going to see later. What do I mean by magic? Uh, when we go and start using these to induce distributions, uh, we're going to get PSDDs and they're going to have really remarkable properties. And the reason is, uh, the secret is uh, by observing the following, and this may make more sense to people who are experienced in probabilistic reasoning. In probabilistic reasoning, there is the notion of case analysis, that if you are trying to compute, uh, let's say, the probability of some event alpha, and if you have a bunch of other events that are mutually exclusive and exhaustive, like primes, right? So remember, the primes are G1 all the way through Gn. They are mutually exclusive and exhaustive. Then you can write this as probability of alpha given G1 multiplied by the probability of G1 plus da 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 probability of alpha given gn multiplied by the probability of gn. This is a very important probabilistic decomposition, if you want to think. And a lot of the techniques in probabilistic reasoning end up using something like this. Usually the tricky part is to get these guys. And as you can see, the PSDD is the SDD circuit is actually taking your Boolean formula and decomposing it in this fashion. So that is going to facilitate probabilistic uh, uh, reasoning. All right, uh, because to to get these guys, I already have decompositions for them that allow me to apply this, and uh, that ends up actually being pretty influential, as you will see later. All right, so let's move on. And now I want to talk about the notion of structured spaces before we even get to PSDDs and learning from data and knowledge. This is an important concept. And we've seen it, right? So the, the idea was that I have some variables that define states of the worlds. And because of knowledge, I end up eliminating some of them. And I only have these feasible states, which I'm going to call the structured space. So I want to show you actually three examples of that. One is probably not too surprising. The other two are surprising and shows you how versatile this notion of a structured space is and also shows you how applicable the techniques that we're gonna be discussing today are. So the first example of a structured space uh, comes from this toy problem, but it's exemplary of many other things. Um, in this case, I have a department that offers four courses, logic, knowledge representation, probability, and AI. And I have data on what students have 
taken. So uh, each line here tells you didn't take logic, didn't take KR, took probability, didn't take uh, AI. And there are six students that did that and so on. So eventually we're gonna, what, what we want to learn is a distribution based on this data. So we can use it, for example, to reason about what students tend to do. Like I tell you, someone did this and didn't take that. What's the probability that they will take or not take the other course? But it happens in this case that I have the program requirements and prerequisites. So um, everybody must take at least one of probability or logic. Probability is a prerequisite for AI. The prerequisite for KR is either AI or logic. This knowledge can be captured in these three propositional statements, right? This is the first one, you know, probability or logic. This says if someone took AI, they must have taken probability. This says if someone took KR, they must have taken either AI or logic. This is knowledge now. That's what we mean by knowledge in this particular case. And if you look at what this means is, if you look at these four courses, there are 16 possible combinations uh, if we look at the unstructured space. But because of this knowledge, I know, no, only a subset of them is feasible. The others are not allowed. So this is an example of a structured space. And in this case, I wanna learn distribution only over these guys, but not over the others. And um, now in principle, you can try to learn a distribution without these guys. And actually people do that all the time, but that's kind of a suboptimal because you will have to then infer that these are impossible, which is difficult unless you have a lot of data. But if I'm telling you upfront that some combinations are impossible, then that should aid you. And you're already starting upfront uh, with some conclusions before even having seen any uh, example in, in the data set. Okay, so this is the kind of more intuitive, common. And next I'm gonna show you two more examples of structured spaces and what they allow you to do, and in particular, what the techniques that we will be talking about, um, we will do. But just again, uh, as far as big picture, what's gonna happen uh, later is that now that I have these logical constraints and they have defined the structured space, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna compile these into an SDD circuit, and then I'm gonna use this to induce a distribution over these feasible states. Now, let's remember, and I want you to visualize this, this circuit is a representation of your structured space in the sense, if you give it one of these uh, feasible states, you pass it as input to the circuit and evaluate it, it will give you a one there. But if you pass it one of these gray uh, states as an input, you're gonna get a zero outside at the top. So this circuit is already capturing your structured space. You can think of this as a rewrite of uh, your domain constraints in, in a fashion that facilitates learning and inference later. And let's not forget, the key thing here is this notion of compilation, uh, which we talked about uh, before. And um, again, this is another secret, is to be successful in compiling because compiling effectively sets the stage for doing all kind of interesting things. Okay, let's look at another example from structured spaces. So in this case, what I want to do is I want to learn distributions over what we call combinatorial objects. And uh, this comes up a lot. And here's two examples. This is the first one. Uh, the combinatorial object here is what we call total orderings or rankings. Uh, this is an example actually that's been discussed in the literature uh, where I'm uh, trying to talk about, uh, you know, preference, user preferences as far as liking different types of sushi. There's 10 of them. And the idea here is uh, this is ranked first. Someone likes shrimp first and then sea urchin and then da, da, da. Well, this is a different total ordering of these guys. Now, if you have 10 items, you have that many total orderings. If you have 20 items, you have that many total orderings. And the idea is I may have data on user preferences. So I may go to people and say, okay, order these guys from one to 10 and they will do that. And that would be my data set, a whole set of total orderings that people provided. And my goal is to learn a distribution over these total orderings. Again, to start perhaps reasoning about user preferences. If someone said uh, tuna is my number five, 
and uh, shrimp is number one, what is the probability that sea eel would be number eight? You can start doing things like this. And this is a simple example from total orderings. Same ideas apply for things like partial rankings or tiers and so on. So one application of this is what people call recommender systems or reasoning about user preferences. Now, normally, uh, people would develop dedicated probabilistic formalisms for reasoning and learning depending on your combinatorial object. But now we're going to see in this framework that we'll be discussing how this can be done systematically. So here's an idea. You say, look, I'm going to actually define a structured probability space that correspond to total orderings. And then I'm going to compile it into an SDD circuit. And then we'll use what we're going to do next to learn and reason about those distributions. Now, how are we going to do this? Well, we can go ahead and introduce these Boolean variables, A, I sub J, with the meaning that item I is at position J in that ordering. So if I have N items, then I need N square of these Boolean variables. And then you may think, well, uh, then these variable instantiations will correspond to my total orderings. Not yet, because you will see that some of these variable instantiations may end up assigning an item to more than one position, or they may have multiple items in the same position. So not every variable instantiation of these variables will end up corresponding to a total ordering. And how do we fix this? Simply by writing Boolean constraints that are satisfied only by those variable assignments that correspond to total ordering. So let's see how this works. Here I have only four items and therefore four positions. And remember, a i sub j means item i is at position j. The problem, as we mentioned, is you want to constrain the variable settings. So, and, and this can be done by adding two types of constraints. Let's look first at this guy here. What are these variables say? This is all the variables for item two. This says item two is in position one, item two is in position two, in position three, in position four. What we really want to say is, um, Precisely one, the, one of these can be true and the others have to be false, right? So if, if the item is in position three, it cannot be in four, two, or one. And, and you can do this using a Boolean constraint that looks like this. What we're doing here is we're taking a particular item, in this case two, and iterating over all positions, J, right? We're iterating over these positions and we're writing the following. A I sub J, that means item I is in position J and item I cannot be in position K if K is different than J, right? So this is enforcing the fact that each item is assigned to a unique position. And I will need N of these constraints, one for each item. Similarly, I wanna say that each position can be assigned a unique item. And that's shown here. So this is position two and item one in position two, item two in position two, three, and four. Similarly, I will iterate over all item. So we're talking about a position J now. And I iterate over all possible items I. And I say, if this item I is in that position J, then, right, not K, J. No other item can be in that position if it's different than I, okay? So that would be our knowledge in this case, these two set of constraints, because if I take these and only insist on uh, variable assignment that satisfy them, then those variable assignments will correspond to my combinatorial objects that I'm interested in, in this case, which is total orderings. I have that many constraints in this case. The unstructured space is this. Remember, we have n square variables. Each one of them could be in two states. So that's the total size of the unstructured space. But the actual structured space, the subset of this that I care about is n factorial, which is the number of total orderings over n elements. So the idea is, if you take these constraints and compile them into an SDD circuit, then that circuit is capturing the space of total orderings in the sense, if you pass it a variable assignment that looks like this, red means true and, and the others are false, this would be a valid variable assignment. It corresponds to a valid total ordering where item two is in the first position, item four in the second, item one in the third, and item three in the fourth, then it should generate a one. 
But if you pass it a variable assignment like this one, which is not valid, uh, because for example, item two appears in two positions and moreover position two has two items, then it will pass a zero. So my SDD circuit now captured my space of combinatorial objects. And then we'll see how you can use this. When you convert it into a PSDD, you can start learning distributions over total orderings and uh, reason with that. This is remarkable because particularly for total orderings, there is a whole literature in probabilistic reasoning where people dedicated, uh, uh, developed dedicated formalisms for distributions over total orderings. And here you're basically getting it for free. Let's see, uh, there is some question here. Uh, someone is asking about uh, this, this. This is a Boolean variable, true or false, which means is item I in position J? So true or false. And let's see, there's another question. Yes, in this case, everything is in the scope of the big disjunction. So this is like this. All right, so I hope this uh, clarifies it. All right, so going back to my thought that for total orderings in particular, people have developed uh, many formalisms. And in a sense here, you're getting it for free. All you need to know is how to write these constraints. And of course, you have to succeed in compiling the constraints into NSDD. But if you do, you're basically in good shape. So I want to show you one more example of structured spaces. And again, that corresponds to combinatorial objects. It's going to look like a toy example, but actually later in the lecture, I will uh, show you how this was applied at scale. And this is where my uh, combinatorial objects uh, correspond to routes on a map. But in this case, we'll start with a simple grid. And the idea is I have a source and destination, and I want to find the routes between the source and the destination. This could have been a map where these uh, nodes represent cities and the edges represent streets. Um, and the idea is I want to learn distributions over routes and from GPS data, for example. And instead of a grip, I have a real map. And again, we'll show you some very scalable applications of this uh, data. So similar idea. You have to think of how do I generate this structured space that correspond to legitimate routes from a source to a destination. And the first step here is to come up with your Boolean variables. The general methodology is you think of Boolean variables. That's usually not too difficult, except that you'll find that the variable assignments do not necessarily correspond to your combinatorial objects. And then you write additional constraints that constrain these and filter the bad ones and keep only the, the good ones. This is the exercise of defining a structured space. Let me ask you a question. If I want to start here by coming up with Boolean variables, any idea what these Boolean variables would mean in this particular case? Um, ah, good. Someone is saying, uh, if you pick an edge like this one, you give it a Boolean variable. So every edge is a Boolean variable. And if it is, True, that means this edge is on the route. It's false, it's not on the route. Excellent. And that's exactly what we're going to do. Uh, you're going to have a Boolean variable for every street or edge. And as we mentioned, uh, some of these variable assignments will be good. They do represent routes like this one. Um, so these variables, uh, this would be E1 is on, and this is on, 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 and everything else is off. That's a good variable assignment. And believe it or not, in this case, there is 184 only. Now, why do I say only? Because here's a bad variable assignment. This does not correspond to a route. It's, um, again, this is the variable is on, the red ones are on, and the ones that are not colored are off. And actually, there's a lot more of these. Now, we're, gonna, we're not gonna write the formula in this case. It's a little bit more involved, but you can write a Boolean formula that will be satisfied only by variable assignments that uh, correspond to routes. And in that case, you've already defined your structured space of routes. And in this case, remember the unstructured space is two to the 24. I have 24 variables, but look the portion of them that is actually valid. And um, you can imagine if you're starting off without isolating these guys, um, 
how uh, more difficult this problem will be. The interesting thing, guys, is in this particular application, for example, your constraints, uh, we alluded to the fact that they only represent a connected path from the source to the destination, but it could be more. You could say, uh, I want every route to pass through a particular city. Or you could say, I want the routes not to pass through a particular city. And then you start excluding uh, these. And um, that gives you the power of this, right? If, if you were developing a dedicated uh, framework for reasoning about routes, you will end up wanting to do different things uh, if you start having these kind of constraints. In this case, you get them for free. Someone is asking about how large do these things get? Let's talk about this later. For routes, I'm gonna give you some examples uh, uh, later uh, about that. Okay, folks, let me just again do a concrete example here. As I said, this particular application is not a toy one. Uh, one of our PhD students who just graduated uh, last summer, Jason Chen, did his thesis on the subject is currently at Waymo. And I'll show you some very scalable results later uh, where uh, countries, uh, you know, maps for like small countries were compiled successfully and route distributions were learned about them. But just to uh, imprint this further into your minds, now let's look at a real graph, uh, which is more resembling of a map than what we looked at. The nodes are the cities. And here I label the streets as variables. And this is the source and the destination. And here's an example route uh, or two routes from the source to the destination. And again, for these variables, A through H, um, uh, true means that edge is on the route. False means it's not on the route. So here's an example of a variable instantiation. Uh, this one, which actually corresponds to this route and it's a valid variable instantiation. And here's a different instantiation, which is not a route, okay? This is a variable instantiation. The difference were these guys, and that should be uh, ruled out. Once more, if we take the Boolean constraints, compile them into a circuit, this is not a properly formed SDD circuit, but doesn't matter, it's a Boolean circuit. And you can see that this circuit now is representing this map. As far as the legitimate routes from source to destination, for example, if you pass it this particular instantiation, which corresponds to this valid route, then this circuit will evaluate to one. But if you go ahead and pass it this variable instantiation as an input, which corresponds to this guy, it will give you a zero that this is not a valid route. So I hope you now can see how a circuit, a Boolean circuit, is actually a compilation of your map. Uh, and representing uh, all legitimate routes from a source to a destination. But remember, we're gonna be compiling these into SDD circuits. It's not just a representation of your space. It is actually a tractable representation. So it allows you to do very interesting things as you would see uh, later. Very good. And that's a visualization here of what we talked about. Valid instantiation generates a one, uh, invalid instantiations generate a zero. And now we're ready to talk about PSDDs, that we've been armed with all of these ingredients. So what we'll start with is uh, showing you the syntax of PSDDs. You're going to see how simple it is. And then we'll do the semantics of PSDDs. And again, you'll see how this is. And actually in the second part of the lecture, we'll start talking about learning from data using these guys and reasoning with them. So let's get started. Here we go. And this is one of the examples we looked at before, right? So I had Boolean constraints and this is my structured space. I had four variables. Unstructured space is 16 possible instantiations. The structured space as defined by these Boolean constraints is only these, I think, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And my goal is to induce a distribution over only the structured space. And here's how it works. It turns out to be very simple. All you have to do is go to every OR gate and put a distribution over its inputs. And you do this only for OR gates. So it would look something like this. Here's this OR gate. It has three inputs and I put the distribution 0 0.1, 0 0.3, 0 0.6. These guys have to be between zero and one and they have to add up to one. Here's another OR gate, 0 0.6, 0 0.4. 
here's another OR gate, one, zero, and so on. So this is basically it. The, the, the main thing is these local distributions like this one are independent of the other local distributions. So the numbers you're going to put here and the numbers they're going to put there have nothing to do with each other. They, these guys are assigned independently of each other. And as it turns out, and we'll see how, when you do this, uh, this defines a distribution over these guys. That is, it will give you a distribution that if you pass it one of the shaded things, it will end up being a zero. And if you pass it one of these guys, it will end up being a number. And the numbers that are assigned to the nine feasible ones will end up adding to one, regardless of how you assign these numbers. When someone tells you the story and say, look, just put these numbers and that will induce a distribution. The first thing you'll ask them, well, how do I put these numbers? What do they mean? Uh, that will be learned from data, but I will tell you what they mean in just a little bit. The other question you have to ask, but wait a minute, what is the distribution? What, what, distri what is the meaning of this? What is the distribution that this is inducing? The other question you have to ask, can I actually induce every possible distribution that way? So let's start with the first question which is, okay, fine. I'm gonna put these numbers like you told me, and that looks pretty easy. I go to every OR gate and I throw a local distribution. Well, tell me, what is the distribution over the whole space that is induced by this guy? And the story could be told in two different ways. We're gonna start with one of them now, and we're gonna tell the second story in the second part of the lecture. But here's how it works. Very simple. All I have to show you is, if you give me one of these states, what is the probability that this creature, which is called the PSDD, what is, that, what is the probability that this creature assigned to that row? If I show you how to do that, we're done. We, we, I told you what is the distribution induced by this creature. And the first story breaks it into two pieces. What if you give me one of these guys? Now, you know, if I give you one of these shaded guys and you evaluate the circuit, what are you gonna get there? what number are you going to get there? We're talking about the Boolean circuit. If I evaluate the Boolean circuit into one of these shaded guys, I get a zero. Okay. The shaded guys are the impossible ones. So if I evaluate the circuit in one of them, I get a zero. If I, the Boolean circuit, if I evaluate it into one of the not shaded ones, I get a one. So this circuit already can tell the feasible from infeasible. So now let's focus about, on the probability of the feasible. So if you give me a feasible one, and evaluate the circuit, here's what's gonna happen. You're gonna get a one here, right? So this is a one. Now, remember, these are SDD circuits. What does that mean? They are deterministic. What does that mean? If you go to the OR gate, you're gonna find that um, it will have at most one high input. Now it has already a high output. That means it has exactly one high input and that's the guy here. So we're gonna chase it down, all right? So we're going down this now. So we started here, now we're here. And gate, since its output is high, both of the inputs are high. So I'm gonna chase these guys too. And repeat the process. This is an OR gate, output is high, must have exactly one high input. And it's this guy, I'm gonna chase it. And, uh, and we'll have both of these or we have exactly one and, and similarly. So because this is an SDD circuit and because it's deterministic, when it produces a one, you can generate the sub-circuit by just following the red wires. If, if you have an OR gate, there's precisely one red wire feeding into it. So you take that one. If it's an AND gate, all of the input wires will be high. You chase both of them. And now this is the circuit that's being evaluated while setting every variable to true. So that corresponds to this last row here. I'm trying to show you how to compute the probability of that last row, all right? So you evaluate the circuit, you follow the red sub-circuit, and all you have to do is multiply all of the parameters that you come across in that sub-circuit, which are all shaded in gray in this case. So you take their product, and that would be the probability of your um, variable assignment. Okay, so now I showed you how to compute the probability of every variable assignment using this simple procedure. 
And that defines the distribution that is induced by this PSDD circuit. Now, here's one of the interesting things. Am I guaranteed to get a normalized distribution? This is gonna give me a number for each one of these guys. Uh, are they gonna add up to one? Yes, guaranteed. And that's regardless of how you put these numbers. We put them in this way. You could have put them in any other way. The only thing you have to ensure is that the distribution on an OR gate is normalized. That's the only thing you have to guarantee. And then this process that I just showed you is guaranteed to generate a normalized distribution. It will assign a zero probability for these guys and the probabilities it's gonna assign for the other guys will add up to one. So it is a uh, normalized distribution and that is the semantics of uh, PSDD. Now we're gonna say more things about it later and um, you'll see that the, the story about what distribution is represented by the PSDD becomes simpler later but not only is this distribution normalized, it has a number of properties, some deep properties that are imp implied by the underlying Boolean circuit. So this distribution is this because I assign these parameters in this way. You could have assigned them differently and you get a different distribution, but all of them satisfy some properties that you can infer from the structure of the Boolean circuit. For people who are familiar with things like Bayesian networks, this is similar to saying, uh, if you give me the Bayesian network structure, then whatever distribution it induces by parameterizing that Bayesian network, all of these distributions will satisfy some properties that I can infer from the structure of the Bayesian network. This is the same story, but on circuit. I wanna give you next a hint of the properties of the distributions satisfied by this. Someone is asking, where do the probability distributions come from? Data, yes. We're gonna cover this in the second part of the lecture. I'm gonna show you how you can estimate these parameters from data, okay? Okay, folks, what are these numbers? Let's, let's start at the top ones uh, that we assigned to the first level of the decomposition. And, and here you have to remember that this is NSDD. What does it mean to be NSDD? Uh, this fragment is made of primes and subs, right? So remember, we call these the primes and these were the subs here, sub, 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 okay? Now, what is a prime? A prime is this, a Boolean circuit, forget about the numbers now. A prime is this Boolean circuit here. So it really represents a Boolean event. It's, it's a Boolean formula, right? And this prime is also this circuit here, which is a Boolean formula. And this guy is a Boolean formula, okay? Here's the thing. If you go to this PSDD, which induces a distribution, and go to that distribution and say distribution. What is the probability you're assigning to the event P1? Distribution. What is the probability you're assigning to P2 and P3? Anybody gonna guess what we're gonna get? What are these probabilities? They're gonna end up being these three numbers. Exactly. So I put 0 0.1, 0 0.3, 0 0.6. If I put 0 0.2, 0 0.1, 0 0.7, that's gonna induce a new distribution, a different distribution. If you go to that distribution and ask it, what are the probabilities of these three guys? It's gonna give you that guy. So actually these are, end up being the probabilities of the primes. Remember, this is like a decision node. If P1 pass sub one, if P2 pass sub two, if P3 pass that, this is in a way is the distribution over these cases, case analysis. Okay, now this is for the root node. It gets a little bit more interesting when you, this is not the general uh, interpretation. I'm just gonna give you this and we we'll take our break. Let's go to the next level. So this was the first decision node. Let's look at another decision node now, this one here. And here's the two primes, Q1 and Q2. What are the probabilities of these guys? Now you may think if you ask the distribution induced by this PSDD, what's the probability of Q1 and Q2? You would think it would be these. Not exactly, it is this. This number here is the probability of Q1 given P2. And this, this number here is the probability of Q, uh, Q2 given P2, all right? So it is the probability of these primes given that this branch was selected, given that this decision node you know, made that choice. The point here is these parameters are interpretable. They do have meanings and these meanings are assigned to them by the underlying Boolean circuit, all right? And there is more 
properties of these distributions that are a function of the underlying Boolean circuits. It's a fascinating story. Um, you can read the details uh, of that in the paper, but we're going to take our break now. When we get back, we're going to see how uh, you can evaluate these and how you can uh, learn the parameters from data. So let's take our break and come back at 11. Thank you. <laughs> 